I'd like to call this uh, meeting of the Arlington, Arlington Redevelopment Board to order. Just pull my agenda back up. This open meeting of the Arlington Redevelopment Board is being conducted remotely consistent with Governor Baker's executive order of March 12th, 2020 due to the current state of emergency in the Commonwealth due to the outbreak of the COVID-19 virus. In order to mitigate the transmission of the COVID-19 virus, we've been advised and directed by the Commonwealth to suspend public gatherings and as such, the governor's order suspends the requirement of open meeting law to have all meetings in a publicly accessible physical location. Further, all members of public bodies are allowed and encouraged to participate remotely. For this meeting, the Redevelopment Board is convening via Zoom as posted on the town's website, identifying how the public may join. Please note that this meeting is being recorded and that some attendees are participating via video conference. Accordingly, please be aware not to share your screen as other people may be able to see you. Anything that you broadcast may be captured by the recording. So I will uh, take a roll call for attendance. Uh, Ken Lau. David Watson. Present. Jean Benson. Present. And I am Rachel Zemberry, and I am here as well. Let's see. So, oops, sorry, one second. What we can do is, um, open up the individual hearings. Uh, unfortunately, because there were only three of us this evening, we will not be able to vote on any of the, um, on any of the hearings on the agenda. So I do apologize to all. We will need to continue those to a, um, to a future meeting date, uh, but we can certainly uh, hold the, the hearings this evening. So with that being said, we'll open up the first docket of this evening, which is docket number 3638, 400 to 402 Massachusetts Avenue. Um, I believe that we have attorney Anessi with us this evening. Yes, we do. Great, right. thank you. Great, yes. Joel, before we do that. Well, I, I, I just want to say something as well, yeah. I, Sorry, I David, wanted, please. I just wanted to be clear, um, if we open the hearings, without members present, are they going to be able to vote when it comes to a vote? Good question. I don't believe that they will. No, so we they, might not they will, they will. That what, what happens as it's happened in the past is we have a, a member who cannot be present, watch the recording, and then they come back to the next meeting when there's a time that the hearing has been continued and they state that they've watched the hearing and the proceedings, and then they're ready to vote. Um, this has happened with many other hearings in the past on the board. Great, so it must have been okay. before my time on the board. Thank you for the clarification, Jenny. Great, so uh, I will just um, remind anyone who is presenting this evening, we do have a, a full docket. So if you could please keep your remarks to around five minutes, uh, that would be appreciated. So we will uh, turn over the, uh, I believe it, Attorney Anessi, are you beginning for uh, yes. this document? Great, yes. thank you so uh, much. Technical question, uh, I may be wrong, but I was always under the impression that you had to have a quorum before you could conduct an official meeting. Maybe I'm wrong about that, okay? But that was always my understanding. Uh, it's a five member board. So my understanding would be that in order to have an official meeting that you would have to have four members uh, present uh, for the hearing. Uh, I wanna go ahead with the hearing, okay? But I don't want to uh, be placed in a situation where we do it and then we find out that it wasn't a legal meeting. Uh, so, uh, I don't know how we get clarification of that. Town Council is probably not on the Zoom, uh, but uh, that's always been my understanding. Maybe I'm wrong. Would you like me to clarify? Jenny, please, please. Three people, is that would be a quorum of this board. Four people would be needed to vote on any special permits as stated in 40A. But in order to have a meeting, which we have done in the past, if needed, 
we can have three people. There cannot be any votes of special permits with four people present, with, without four people present, however. And that has also happened before and we had to wait and continue a hearing. So legally you are allowed to continue this meeting should you wish to. I'm certainly willing to go ahead with it, uh, you know, based upon that representation on the part of uh, 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 Jenny, uh, if you are as well. All right. Please. Okay. All right. Just to uh, recap uh, where we were, we've been before the board before, and we did have a, a, an inkling from the board, more than an inkling, uh, as to what the board thought they would uh, be prepared to approve. And at that time, uh, my understanding was that the board might have been a might have been in a position to approve uh, three residential units. We were looking for four. Just to recap a little bit of the history on the property itself, uh, the property, of course, uh, uh, as I think the zoning decision indicated, was the subject of a fire back around 1980. At that time, the building was rebuilt. So it wasn't the building that it was in 1790 or 1800. It was a totally different building when it was rebuilt in 1980. Now I've scoured the building department reports to see whether I could find any plans relating to the 1980 zoning decision and I've not been able to find any. I did speak with Mike Byrne, the building inspector, and I asked Mike whether he had any plans going back to 1980 with respect to that decision. And he indicated to me that they did not. Uh, surprisingly, they had records from uh, 1979 and 1981, but the records from 1980 uh, could not be found. What he did provide to me uh, was a card. What would happen would be if there was any action taken by the zoning board, uh, the, there would be a card generated by uh, one of the members of the building inspection department. And a card was generated on June 3rd of 1980 in the name of Frank Prescuto, uh, who by the way had acquired the property uh, shortly before that from the public covers uh, uh, after the fire had occurred. And that card indicated that there could be reconstruction of a uh, two-story building for offices and apartments. Uh, we then had the zoning decision that occurred uh, uh, with respect to uh, that card uh, and the application that would have been filed and these, uh, the zoning decision indicated that there could be two residential units and three office units. There have been two residential units, not more than two residential units as has been rumored uh, around the town uh, based on what I'm hearing, okay? But two residential units. Uh, the property has always been advertised uh, with respect to it being the, the, the resident units, two resi uh, residential units with one parking space for each unit. And that's what is there now. I know this is a, an assessing record that shows more than that, but I learned early, uh, early on as a lawyer, as a young attorney in this town doing zoning, that one never relied on uh, assessing records for the purpose of determining what the status of zoning was. So notwithstanding that the assessing record might say that there were more units than two, there are not, okay? There were two units. Uh, there were three office units. And the three office units are as shown on the plans of Ken File. And by the way, the rent that we're getting for the, uh, the two residential units would be $1,600 a month. And I would suggest to the members of the board that $1,600 a month is what the going rate is for a one bedroom unit, not a two bedroom unit. A two bedroom unit in this town would, would demand more than $1,600 a month. I know that to be the case because I have a building where I have, I have two residential units and $1,600 a month is the going rent. So 
Mr. Nessie, uh, I just want to let you know you have just about a minute. Um, if you could try and make sure that all your points are made, that would be great. Say again? You have about a minute left. If you could try and all right, all right. make sure we have all, all your What I'm going to do is ask, uh, let me just generally, uh, I wanted to get that out because something had been submitted to the board, okay, that I think is inaccurate, okay? But let me just say this, we've made changes to the pl uh, plan. Ken File is going to talk about the changes, okay, uh, about the bicycle storage uh, area that's going to be located in the building in a different location. Uh, we're gonna have six spaces inside, three spaces outside. Uh, we're gonna have wash and, uh, washers and dryers. Again, we're asking for four units not three, okay? And the reason for that is I go back to what I argued before, and that is the difficulty in uh, renting uh, uh, office units uh, in the town. Uh, Ken, why don't you jump in and talk about what you're showing on the plan and what has changed on the plan from what had been submitted before? Sure. Um, sure. And, and, sorry, before you begin, if you could just be succinct, your, um, yes. your team is definitely over the, the five minute allotment. I do want you to be able to make your points, but please, if you could do so succinctly, that would be fantastic. I would love to, so I'll do that Thank right you. now. If we could go to uh, sheet A101, the second page, please. What we continue to show is a covered trash enclosure um, at, the, uh, at the rear of the building. Um, we continue to show the three exterior bike racks for temporary use. Um, and we have relocated the bike storage to the first floor um, on the left-hand side um, with its own entry. Um, the owner has uh, reduced the rentable square footage to allow that to happen. And we have also flipped the living room and bedroom in the basement um, apartment um, as per recommendations uh, by the board, and we have added in the new apartments um, washers and dryers in each unit. And I mistakenly have labeled the uh, upper level of this uh, of this building um, as a third story, third floor, but it actually should be called um, the half. It's the attic half story. Um, that's uh, number four uh, on A one hundred and one, and that is that's what I have to say. Uh, can I just add something? Oh, right? yes, the electric charging station. And we fa I failed to show the electric charging station that we had previously shown on other drawings mm -hmm. submitted to the board. And that would be located just below parking spot number two against the building by the washer and dryer. Correct, right there on the exterior, right where the pointer is now. My apologies for uh, the drafting error. May I add something, Rachel? Sure, if you could conclude, that would be great. Very, very quickly. Uh, we are uh, offering uh, Transportation Management Act, uh, 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 not concessions, but uh, advantages as well. Uh, the indoor parking, of course, okay, the bicycle parking, uh, the charging station, uh, and uh, we are also going to, and by the way, we don't have to do that because if you read the, uh, re a report from the planning department, that report indicated uh, that we did not have to gain relief for, uh, for parking, okay? But we're gonna offer that anyway. In addition, we're gonna offer a shower in the office unit. Now, I just point that out to you because uh, we're asking for four units. We don't think we can make it happen with three economically, we've tried. Uh, the Prescuto family at 882 Mass Ave has all one bedroom units. They're very familiar with that. They know what they can do with the one bedroom units, but they're not able to do uh, anything uh, appreciable with office units at this point. If the matter goes back to the Zoning Board of Appeal, then you folks see jurisdiction to the Zoning Board of Appeals at that point, and we're stuck with what we have. What we have is two units, uh, residential and the three office units. We would rather be before the ARB because we think that's where the jurisdiction ought to be. Uh, so we're asking that the board reconsider what their thoughts were at the last hearing and uh, think about uh, the, the possibility of giving us the four residential units, which I think the planning department memo had recommended, okay, uh, give us the four residential units and a one office unit. Thank you. 
I will now uh, open it up to uh, the board for any questions. Uh, we'll, in, we'll include our discussion following public comment. Start with, starting with Jean, do you have any questions on the new material that was submitted this evening? I have no questions on the additional material. Thank you. Thank you. David, do you have any questions on the new material submitted? Uh, I also have no questions on the new material. Great. Thank you very much. Uh, so we will now open this up for uh, public comment. Uh, any members of the public wishing to speak and comment on uh, this proposal, please use the raised hand function, which is under the participants button at the bottom of your Zoom screen. I will call on you in the order of hands that are raised. When you're called on, please remember to state your name first and last for the record, as well as um, your address, please. And the first speaker this evening will be Don Seltzer. Reminder, you. You, you have uh, three minutes to, to speak. Thank you. Thank you, Madam Chair. Don Seltzer, Irving Street. I have some slides submitted and I, I appreciate if they could be put up at this time. Um, this is a follow-up to my previous remarks regarding the problems with this property and the 1980 special permit. I put together uh, the paper trail of relevant permits related to the renovation. I've distributed the information in these slides to the board. I hope they can be put up. Um, so I'll just hit upon the high points and answer any questions as to the specifics. 400 Mass Ave was built in 1799 as a two-story federal style house. If my slides were being put up, you could see what it looked like in 1973. It had a simple gabled roof with no dormers. It was in 1978, it was damaged by fire. The owner at that time took out a permit to repair damages, but it seemed that very little work was actually done. A little more than a year later, it was sold for 48, thousand dollars to its current owner who immediately applied for a special permit for renovation from the zoning board. Uh, if my slide was up there, I would call attention to the specific details in the special permit. It allowed two one bedroom apartments on the second floor and three professional offices below. The gross area calculations that are shown in the permit were for the first and second floors and the basement. There was no third floor area specified. The floor area ratio was claimed to be 0.74, just within the bylaw limit of 0.75. Parking was computed on the basis of two one bedroom apartments. Now, if we move ahead to 1996, uh, again, I have a slide which showed what it looks like in the historical inventory survey. Sometime after the 1980 special permit, the present owner of 400 Mass Ave added dormers in front. The roof was raised in the rear and skylights added. It expanded both of the one bedroom apartments on the second floor up to the third floor, converting them to two bedrooms. And in fact, they had been advertised in the past as two bedroom apartments. The floor area ratio increased from 0.7 to 4, 0.74 to 1.2. The required parking would have increased by conversion from the two one bedroom units to two two bedroom units. There were no building permits taken out for any of this reconstruction. The applicant did not go back to the zoning board to ask permission for revising the original special permit. Last year, the zoning board transferred jurisdiction to the redevelopment board. This is your problem now to deal with. The buck stops here. I'd be glad to answer any questions on the details of the history. Thank you, Mr. Seltzer. So I'll just state that where we are now, the, the board is looking at this, uh, the current configuration is a pre-existing non-conforming uh, use and uh, is going to be reviewing the case, specifically the um, the request in terms of the, the change of use only as we are during this hearing. That is, that is the uh, purview that we, are, that we are currently working under right now. The next speaker will be, um, oh, sorry, Jean. 
Yeah, thank you. I, I just Sorry, I question. couldn't see you up on the screen. <laughs> That's okay. I just have a question to ask um, Mr. Seltzer. One of the previous meetings, I asked if you were going to um, report what you had found to inspectional services, and I believe you said you were putting together the materials to do that. I just wondered if you have done that, and if so, if you've gotten a response. I have uh, sent this information both to the Zoning Board of Appeals and Inspectional Services. Um, I have gotten responses from uh, Christian Klein of the ZBA. In fact, he was kind enough to provide me with um, the historical inventory records, which provided the two photographs, which I hope would have been put up, but uh, for some reason, um, I still do not see them being shared on the screen. So I thank Christian for that and he's taken an interest. Uh, I have gotten no response whatsoever from inspectional services. Thanks. I should say that while your images were not up on the screen, we all did have a chance to see them before the meeting. So they're well appreciated. Thank, thank you. you. Thank you. The next speaker this evening will be Colleen Cunningham. Hi, it's actually Stuart Boris and Colleen's um, husband. Colleen is here with me too. So I'll just start with a quick joke. Um, I'm which sorry, is, I, could, could you please state your address for the record? Oh yeah, sure. Stuart Porson, Kensington Park. Thank you. Um, you know, just a quick joke. And, and, and that is just simply, you know, if I go to Wall Street, if I go to my broker and I buy a thousand dollars worth of some stock and then it tanks, um, I think I'd like to turn to the town of Arlington too to see if I could get them to uh, uh, reimburse me for my, for my investment. But seriously, the the, the 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 lawyer here is basically saying um, he's representing the economic interest of his client, which is fair enough. The economic interest of his client is a short-term sort of um, interest of his. He wants to maximize his profit, which I guess is how you know our society is set up, and that's that's fine. the The job of a town body like yourself, and I'm sure you know this. I'm just you know trying to give you some backup is to keep an eye on the long-term interest of the town. And the long-term interest of the town, um, you know, is reflected in the zoning codes. And the zoning codes are there because we want to have something like a, a downtown area that has offices so that people can have, um, you know, professionals have places to work out of here in Arlington. Um, we all recognize that COVID has put a crimp in that for the last, and it, you know, may put a crimp in it for the next, year or two, but the interest of Arlington needs to be represented by this body and the interests of Arlington are long-term interests like, are we gonna have a vibrant downtown in 20 years or 50 years? And um, if everything that we have gets turned into residences based on the short-term interests of property speculators, then that's bad for all of us. So that's all I have to say and thank you very much. Thank you. Uh, the next speaker will be Chris Loretti. Thank you, Madam Chair. Chris Loretti, Adam Street. Can you hear me okay? Yes, we can. Thank you. Um, just a few quick points. Um, one, I just want to reiterate again that a four unit apartment building is not allowed in, in the B1 zoning district. And I would like to remind the board of the decision um, that the court made in Darlow versus the ARB this fall. Um, while unfortunately the um, the folks in that case chose the wrong attorney and for um, procedural reasons it was it was the case was dismissed the judge did note that the arb represented to town meeting that it would not be permitting prohibited uses in um as part of mixed use developments and that's the judge's reading on that and i think the board needs to seriously take that into account um, the other thing i would add is that last august town council provided some memo that seemed to suggest that the board could very liberally interpret the zoning bylaw to allow violations. Well, I took a look at the case law he cited in that memo, and I could not find one case where the court said that boards like the planning board or a zoning board of appeals could allow a violation of the zoning bylaw unless explicitly authorized or, or contemplated by the zoning bylaw. And I don't see that at all in this case. Um, I thank Mr. Seltzer for his demonstration that the uh, floor area ratio is currently being violated. 
And there is no protection for that if that was done without a permit. Um, so the fact that it's a, it is not a pre-existing non-conforming use, it is simply a non-conforming non-conforming use. And the board should not be sanctifying those sorts of non-conforming uses by granting a special permit. I would just like to close um, with one question, Madam Chair, and I realize this may not be fair since um, one of your members is missing. And I would like to know whether any members of the board have had any ex parte communications with the applicant or his team, or their team, I should say, since the last meeting, and if so, if they could report on them. Thank you. Thank you. I would remind uh, Mr. Loretti and everyone, uh, first of all, that the um, case that was referenced um, was was uh, was dismissed, and um, second, that the board uh, does not conduct ex parte communication. Um, there, there. I, I know that I have had no discussions with with the. Um, with the with the um, applicants prior or prior to this meeting outside of this, and we do report on anything that has been um, requested during a meeting to be followed up on with the applicants, which is all in front of as part of public record. Um, let's see. The next speaker will be uh, Steve Rebelak. Hello, Madam Chair, Steve Rebelak, 111 Sunnyside Avenue. Um, just a, one, one comment I would like to make. Uh, this past fall, I took a number of courses with the Citizen Planner Training Collaborative. You know, new ZBA member and these seemed you know, pretty useful. So I took a number of courses, including one on vested rights and, non and pre-existing nonconformities. Now, one of the things I recall from that was, um, you know, and I don't know if this comes from, you know, state law or case law, and I have not done the due diligence to, to sort of follow it through. But my understanding is that after 10 years, an unpermitted modification would be treated as a pre-existing nonconformity. Um, so it's basically a, a, a it's almost a effective effectively like a statute of limitations, um, you know, on doing work without a permit. Now, I mean, it's, if that was done in the past, it's unfortunate, but um, if there is a statute of limitations and that's expired, it's kind of water on, over the dam at this point. Uh, that is all, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you, Mr. Revelak. Uh, is there any, any other member of the public wishing to speak? All right, I see that uh, Chris Loretti has his hand up. If you have any uh, different questions for the applicant, uh, we'll entertain those at this, at this time. All right, seeing none, uh, we will close public comment. Uh, if I could, uh, Rachel. Please. Uh, yeah. Uh, Mr. Revelick mentioned uh, that 10 year statute of limitations, that is chapter 40A section seven, and he's correct. That's what the statute says. Thank you for the clarification. Rachel, if yes. I might, please. Um, one is uh, Mr. Warden was waving his hand. I'm sorry, I can't see. No, that's okay, but before, screen. but before, and I, I know, yeah. <laughs> He just his video is on, so I can see that. But okay. um, also, just to re-emphasize uh, this point, it is past the statute of limitations, as well as the fact that it's at this point, um, as you've stated in the beginning, um, we are we would look at, at this particular case as a pre-existing non-conforming situation. That's that is the way that it is right now. Um, further, I will I will add to what you mentioned in the beginning, which is that this particular property became part of an historic district, but not until 1996. So the records that have been referenced um, previously by one of the speakers um, are important, but do not necessarily illustrate the some of the points that this person is making. If they would like to make it more clearly with regard to uh, something that they think is not um, accurate or legal, that would need to be demonstrated and proven, which we do not have before us right now. And further, the case that was decided by the ZBA 
in 1980 made it very clear what they could build and how high they could build, and they are still in compliance with that. Thank, Thank you. you for the clarifications, Jenny. I appreciate it. Okay, uh, Mr. Warden. Thank you. <clears throat> Thank you, Madam Chairman. John Warden, Jason Street. Um, uh, and we couldn't find the, the raised hand little list of people had sort of disappeared from our screen. So that's why I was, I, I really, I raised, raised a real hand, um, just like we would in a real town meeting or a real hearing. Um, the, 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 I, I would just want to make this point. The, um, the applicant's attorney has uh, made an economic argument that unless you give him all these apartments, whatever he wants, three or four, it's just not economically viable for him. But he says these things, and I've heard these things before, but what are the numbers? What, what does it take to make it viable? And I think without having some real numbers, sort of a spreadsheet and so on, the rents, the costs, the blah, 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 so, so on and so forth, it's just words. Maybe this guy's got to be making himself a millionaire out of this building. We don't know. Um, and, and I think for the board to base any part of his decision on the fact that some lawyer comes in and says he won't make enough money uh, 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 with the building the way it is, uh, I don't think that's right. He says, we're only charging $1,600 a month for rent. Well, why don't you increase the rent? Um, but without without some numbers, we don't know. It's just his speculation. It's like, uh, you know, Mr. Uh, previous speaker said he invests $1,000 and uh, and, and the things goes bust. Well, suppose it doesn't go bust, but after 10 years, it's only worth $1,100. He, should he go to the town and complain, say, hey, I should have made a bigger profit than that, but I'm not gonna tell you what it, what it should be. No, it doesn't work that way. If, if, if you, you wanna base your, your plea or your permit application on, on, on what is the reasonable return, I don't think the board should do it without having some numbers in front of them. Thank you. Thank you, Mr. Warden. Uh, seeing no further uh, members of the public wishing to speak, I will uh, close public comment. Um, David and Jean, I, I wanted to see if you had any uh, further points of discussion before we continue this to next week. Um, I personally, um, my, my feelings on this project remain as they, they were before, but um, I would ask both of you uh, to let me know if there's anything that you'd like to discuss before we move to continue. David? Uh, I also uh, have not changed my feelings on the project, although I have to say I do appreciate the efforts that uh, the proponent has made uh, to uh, respond to many of the comments that we had previously made. Uh, I also do appreciate the material that Mr. Seltzer brought forward, um, but I, I think as, as we've heard, that doesn't um, tell the whole story of, of what has happened and, and what it means from a legal perspective over the last several decades. Um, so that's where I am at the moment. Thank you, David. Jean? And I agree with what both David and Rachel had to say. Great, thank you. Uh, do we hear a motion to continue this to uh, if the a future hearing date? Jenny, I would assume it would be the March 1st. Yeah, March 1st is the next time we meet, next Monday. Attorney Anessi, does that work for you? And again, I apologize that we are not able to close this out this evening. Mr. Anessi. Uh, is Ken. Hi, uh, Cynthia Pesciuto. I'll answer yes that it's fine for the continuance. Thank you. Thank you very much. Wait I appreciate it. Wait a minute. Wait a minute. Can you hear me now, Rachel? No, I can. Yes. Thank All you. Right, okay. I have another hearing on March 1st. I don't mind having two on the same evening uh, if that's what you folks would like to do. Well, it would be March 1st, or we'd have to move it out um, to a to a date later than, than March 1st. So that's really up to you. 
Yeah, go with March 1st. Okay, thank you. Uh, David or Jean, do I hear a motion to continue the hearing to uh, March 1st? So moved. Second. We'll take a roll call vote. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I am a yes as well. The, this hearing will be continued on March 1st. Thank you. Thank you very much. Okay, the next item on our agenda is uh, 1420 Massachusetts Avenue. Uh, we will be uh, opening, opening this hearing. Um, this is uh, for the reconstruction of the Citizens Bank property in Arlington Heights. And do we have a representative for this case? Yes, here? Madam Chair. My name is Dick Keshen. I'm an attorney in currently in Lexington, but formally for decades uh, located on Mass Ave in Arlington. Uh, I represent the developer, Beer Briar Development, and Len Beer Briar, uh, the principal of Beer Briar Development. Um, I would like to introduce the team that I have brought to you this evening to explain the uh, project in whatever detail is acceptable to the board. I do want to just point out a few things. Uh, a bit of irony is that uh, in 1977, I happened to represent the then bank that applied for the original uh, permit for operating uh, a bank at 1420 Mass Ave. Uh, it's unusual only because I'm still only 30 years old. Um, but that having been said, I do wanna point out something about Beer Briar development. I have represented Len Beer Briar for over 25 years in his work here in Arlington. And there's one thing I can say with absolute confidence is that he has upheld every promise he's ever made, written or unwritten, relative to any of his activities in Arlington. Now, with that, I would like to identify and introduce uh, the team members. Tom Godfrey is the owner's representative here, uh, who will give you an overall view of the uh, project of revitalizing this location. Uh, Randy Myron from Bowler Engineering uh, is a land development con uh, consultant. His firm has offices all up and down the East Coast. Uh, and he's been responsible for several projects here in Arlington. And uh, Doug Grunet is the architect of record for the project and uh, has a point of reference, he also was the architect, architect that uh, developed the CVS in Arlington. Uh, he is the senior project manager of his company. And with that, I'll turn it over to Tom to give you an overview of the project. Great, thank you. And if I could just ask again, because we do have a, a pretty full agenda, if you could um, try and keep your presentation to five minutes and the high points, we will certainly have questions for you and um, can get into many of the details during that time as well. Great, thank you, Madam Chair. Thank you. Board members, um, Tom Godfrey, I will pick up where Dick left off and, and try to touch on the highlights of the proposed development. Um, historically, the site has operated as a bank on this site since 1977. Uh, in the special perm, under the special permit that Dick obtained back then. Uh, the site also benefits from a signage special permit that was granted in 1983. Citizens Bank uh, recently signed a new long-term lease on the property uh, and they received federal and state approval to build a new bank branch there and close temporarily while the bank branch is being constructed. Uh, currently, the gross square footage totals about 4,200 square feet. That includes uh, square footage in the basement as well as some canopies. Uh, the new proposed building totals about 2,400 square feet, single story, 
Uh, the current building has really reached at the end of its useful life. Um, it's not compliant with ADA. There's no public restrooms. So the plan is to build them a new building, essentially in the same location and the same finished floor elevation that exists today. Um, the goals in designing the project have been to minimize the um, disruption to the site and obviously decrease the massing and the scale of the building while maintaining the perimeter of the site and limiting uh, disturbance. Um, the plan has been to kind of leave from the curb area out as is, and then the inner area around the curb line where the building would get demolished, we would rebuild it right in its place. Um, so that would be the limits of work that we're talking about. Uh, the building itself, uh, we've designed a signature element in the glass entry way, which is uh, on the front right corner of the building. Uh, one side faces Mass Ave, the other faces the parking area. The feature uh, is about one and a half stories tall, a little higher roof line than the rest of the building has floor to ceiling glass uh, with some wood accents uh, crossing the top, as well as some of the cladding in that area is wood. Um, we've got a couple of windows on the Mass Ave side that line up with some of the public rooms on the inside. The entire building is wrapped with a cultured stone water table. Um, and in addition to the, the architectural element there, We've incorporated um, a pocket park, which sits between the building and Mass Ave itself. We're trying to create some visual interest and create a strong link between the building and the pedestrians on the sidewalk. It's oval in shape. It has a very wide opening onto the sidewalk. It incorporates a, a small retaining wall that contains some seating. Uh, it has a few stairs that goes up to the entrance feature and the front door. Just off of that pocket park, we have our two uh, short-term bicycle parking spaces. We recently updated uh, the style of those. We had originally proposed a wave style and we've changed that spec so that it's more of a hoop style. So that's in, in accordance with the parking uh, bike parking guidelines. We've got a new ADA compliant access way that also leads up to the front entrance um, over by the existing sign. Um, the existing walkway ADA is not compliant. That will provide for a second means of pedestrian egress up to the building. The building sits at about three or four feet above Mass Ave. So the, the ADA path has to meander a little bit to get up there to be compliant. Um, the parking area will remain exactly as is um, in the same location, the same number that exists today. Vehicle entrance and traffic flow will remain the same. Uh, we want to maintain the 15 parking spaces that we have on site today. Uh, the new bank, they anticipate that they could have as many as nine or 10 employees in the building at one time. Uh, that would leave us approximately five spaces for customers um, around the building, especially in the front, around the ADA access way in the pocket park. We'll be enhancing the landscaping. In terms of utilities, we plan to reuse and upgrade everything that's there today. We'll be increasing open space slightly from 23% to 28%. And we've incorporated a new stormwater depression in the back of the building in the landscaped area. Um, that's designed to capture all of our roof runoff and provide some infiltration on the site. Signage, we have uh, submitted a full signage package uh, to the board. The existing site signage will remain as is and we've got an updated building signage package which is before the board. There was one dimension in there, one of the window signs that Citizens is proposing did not have dimensions on it. That sign is 
77 inches high by 73 inches wide. That's a vinyl window sign, which is on the inside of the building. But, um, those are the highlights of the proposed plan. I'd be happy to answer any questions that the board may have, or I can always defer to our civil engineer and our architect. Thank you. Very much. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, we'll start with David. Any questions for the team? Yes, thank you for the presentation. Um, I uh, certainly like the addition of additional open space and, and the pocket park. And I, I think overall, I, I think the design of the building is, is attractive. Um, I'm curious about the decision to orient essentially the, the front of the building to the parking lot rather than to uh, the, the street, uh, especially since this, this is a, uh, a pedestrian area and it's one, in one of our business districts where we're trying to encourage uh, a pedestrian orientation in buildings. I'll try to address that. Yep. The, um, like I mentioned, the site, the building itself sits about three or four feet above Mass Ave today. So today uh, for handicapped accessibility, well, for a ramp to get into the building, obviously the front door today has three or four steps uh, to get into the building. The only way you can enter the building from the parking lot today is to go through a rear entrance in the back of the building. Um, so the orientation of the entrance feature is such that it, it's focused obviously on Mass Ave, but also to the parking area to the side and our handicapped ramp comes up from the sidewalk on Mass Ave, meanders around, it, it meets up with the stairs coming off the pocket park and then continues to raise up in grade, compliant grade, till we get to the side of the building where we just hit the grade and compliance for ADA. So the front of the building where the glass feature is, uh, uh, you would not be able to have a doorway at grade at that location. I don't believe we can do a compliant uh, access to that location. Um, I, I'd really encourage you to, to think about that because it, um, as nice as it is with all the glass, it, it does feel like this kind of blank wall along the pedestrian zone. Uh, and it doesn't seem particularly inviting and really the orientation of the building um, to me makes it um, more uh, automobile centric than, than person centric. Um, and uh, I'd, I'd encourage you to think some more about that. And if, if there's a way to, to bring um, uh, more focus to the to the front of the building and, and uh, perhaps create an entrance there um, without losing the accessibility of the other entrance, certainly. Um, so um, other questions I had, um, I, I did hear you on, with regard to the number of parking spaces uh, and the potential number of employees. Uh, there is on-street parking available in this area, however. And um, since you, you have uh, shown an interest in, in expanding the amount of, uh, of open space on the property, I would urge you to consider reducing the number of parking spaces because you, you've got almost twice as many as you're required to have right now, um, given that there is uh, ample on-street parking available in, in the area. And, uh, that could potentially make the site even more attractive. Also, uh, I think you did mention that you have uh, changed the uh, design of the uh, outdoor bicycle rack to be compliant with our bicycle parking guide. Um, but uh, I wanted to ask whether um, or what your plan was for complying with the requirement for long-term bicycle parking. 
Yes, uh, Citizens has agreed to provide one long-term bike parking space on the inside of the building. In addition to the two that we show long-term off of the park at par pocket park in the front. Okay, I think that meets the requirement. Um, and can you tell us any more about uh, where that would be in the building or how it would be accessed? Um, they do not have full building plans on the inside yet, but it, I believe it potentially could be in the break room. Obviously okay, so it, it can't be a long-term spot for overnight storage other than employees, uh, the public would not be allowed to uh, store anything overnight. Un understood, understood. So is, is the intention at some point to provide uh, detailed interior plans to the board? Um, we have a floor plan currently um, that we could share, but it would not be a final plan. I think that would be helpful. I think just to jump in a little, I think that would, David, you're, you're looking for something to understand how somebody would bring their bike into the, the building in, a, in an unobstructed way. Right, and also with respect to my question about an entrance at the front of the building and the relationship to the, to the pedestrian environment, I wanna make sure I understand the interior layout of the building and how it relates to, to, the, to the front and the entrances. Any other questions, David? Uh, no. Oh, one about signage. I, uh, it, I, I think you were showing signage on, on the building on three sides. And my question was whether it was really necessary to have the additional freestanding sign, which is uh, somewhat sizable. And those were all my questions. I can address that. I believe we have removed one of the building signs um, to the south on the drive through side has been removed. So we just have the signage that is on the entrance feature and the two site signs uh, that I mentioned would remain as is. Great. Thank you, David. And uh, thank you for the answers to the questions, Tom. Uh, Jean. Thank you, and thank you for the presentation. Um, I'll start by saying that I have the same concerns that were expressed by David and were expressed in the public memorandum um, by staff about how the building is oriented toward the street. I don't think it meets either the letter or the spirit of um, what we're looking for. It looks like a side, more like a side of a building building with a fairly big blank wall. So I'd also ask that you um, reconsider that. Um, on the existing spaces, I think if you had taken a look and maybe you probably have at the staff memo, it indicates that if you remove some spaces, there would be the ability or maybe the ability to provide a buffer to the parking lot in compliance with the zoning bylaw to the residential. So I think it would be one thing to ask for a modification of the buffer when there are a certain amount of spaces required and you couldn't meet it. But if there are fewer spaces required and you remove some of the 15 spaces to be able to meet the buffer, then that would be a reason not to give you um, a waiver of that requirement. It would also allow for some more green space, some more trees in the back. So I'm looking for a reconsideration of exceeding the uh, minimum requirements for parking. Um, I'll just mention too um, that I think I would want the DPW to sign off on the stormwater plan that you've proposed and to determine whether 
it requires maintenance and whether we should uh, require any security for that. So it would require you going to public works. Um, I was, I was um, very disappointed in the LEED score. You know, a new bank building should be able to at least do silver, if not gold. And you're very far from that. And you're required by the bylaw to include a narrative of um, how you're getting there and you didn't do it. So I think that requires a redo. I'd also like the bank to consider the possibility of solar on the roof as part of that. Um, there should be the possibility of street trees out front and you probably want to talk to the tree warden about the possibility of planting some street trees out front. And um, that's what I've got. If you want to respond to any of those, I'd be happy to hear the response. Yeah, some of them obviously I can't respond to right of way, but um... You know, what we've tried to do, especially on the street trees, we've got one large tree that we're trying to maintain and work around uh, that exists on the front of the site. We've worked the handicap ramp around it one way and inserted the pocket park on the other. Um, I believe historically there's been some issues with street trees along this frontage and destroying the sidewalk. Um, and there's only a small strip, I believe, available for street trees. We can look at planting a tree or two, um, but we're limited in terms of what we've got remaining after we laid out the pocket park itself. Uh, there's not a lot of excess room there uh, for tree plantings. That's why I suggested a consultation with the town's tree warden. Yep. Great. Uh, thank you, uh, Jean. Tom, did you have any anything else you wanted to? Uh, not directly at this okay. point. Okay. No. Tom, Great, Tom, Tom, Tom uh, if you were, I'd like to actually address something about the front entry uh, for the board. Uh, for the record, my name is Doug Gruner. Uh, we're with BKA Architects. We're the architect of record. And I'd just like to point out that uh, the decision to put the doors uh, where they are also tends to be uh, more accessibly compliant. Uh, ADA, I'm sorry, MAAB typically requires the entry doors be located as close to the accessible parking as possible. If we run it around the corner, um, we'd be um, not in compliance with that. In addition, uh, the grading challenges are also what is um, creating a difficulty putting the doors right on Mass Ave as well. Thank you. Rachel. Yes. Um, I think my comment with respect to the location of the doors was not uh, to move them, but to explore having an additional entrance that was uh, facing the street side. Thank you for the clarification, David. And I, I would... Uh, uh... Agree, I, I can't see a plan uh, or a facade that does not have an entrance off of Mass Ave. Um, this is a very heavily pedestrian area. In fact, there is a crosswalk right in front of your, your building. Um, and to have a, a side, um, basically the side of a building not face, or facing Mass Ave with, with no entrance um, is, is not something that um, really would work in, 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 this, uh, in this business district. Um, I think in addition to having an entrance um, on the side of Mass Ave, as you look at that facade as well, um, I, again, it, it looks like the side of a building. So looking at not only that, if you keep the current, um, the current way that the building is designed with the, with the glass element on the, the, right, the right side of the building, looking at how you also articulate the, the left side of the building in terms of ensuring that there is an element so that that doesn't look like, again, the 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 back back of house which i'm sure is is what it is um but ensuring that you have an architectural element to complete the the building um that faces mass ave would be important to see in the next uh the next time you come in front of us i do have to say that i i do appreciate the fact that you are making this 
building um, and the entire site accessible. I, I, I think that's incredibly important. And um, I, I also think though that it's important that it, that it interacts with the, with the neighborhood. Yep. Thank you. And um, you are correct in that front left corner of the building by the ATM, there is a bit of a back of a house operation there. Um, we've tried to strategically place those front windows so that they are in public rooms, meeting rooms, conference rooms, things like that. Um, so uh, I won't say difficult, but um, doesn't function well to have uh, any windows in and around that corner where it might be the ATM or a cash counting room or things like that. I certainly appreciate that. Um, I, and I, I'm certainly not asking for windows, but I think if you take a look at, at what architectural uh, elements you might be able to, to uh, integrate into, into that, um, to, to basically terminate the building yep. as, on, on that, you know, perhaps there's a, a vertical change in, in material or um, in plane, but um, in some way, I'd like to see that thought finished. Yeah, we can work on something architecturally on the exterior other than windows uh, that might um, provide some more interest on that end. Great, thank you. Uh, so that's, I, I agree with my colleagues um, thoughts and questions and comments. Um, that's all I wanted to add at this time. I'd love to open this up to uh, public comment, unless David or Jean, you have any further questions at this time. Great. I just, I just wanted sure. to um, uh, second Jean's comment uh, about the lead checklist. Uh, I think uh, you did mention in the narrative that sustainability was one of the uh, um, guiding principles of, of the new design, and I, I was also disappointed with the lead score. Rachel, when, when they come back, can we get a new list of the signs with the locations and the sizes? I think that would be helpful. Sure. Um, Jean, before we continue the hearing, I'll run through the full list that I've created of asks from the, from the board so that we're all clear on um, what the expectations are. Thanks. Great. Thank you. So at this time, I'll open uh, the, uh, the floor up for public comment. Anyone wishing to speak uh, with a question or, um, or a comment, please use the raise hand function in the participant section at the bottom of Zoom. When I call on you, you will have three minutes to speak. Please uh, introduce yourself by first and last name and address. The, so the first person to speak this evening will be Eliza Burden. Hi, thank you. Eliza Burden, 44 Brantwood Road. I am also one of the co-chairs of the Arlington Tree Committee. So thank you for talking about trees. Um, just a couple of ideas uh, from regarding trees. Um, with new developments, we're always hoping that we can begin to um, mitigate the heat island effect in any parking lots. So uh, trees are a wonderful way of doing that. Um, in terms of this property, perhaps the left side of the building could, um, in the front, there could be a tree planted that would give that architectural element um, on the left side. And also in the back garden, um, it seemed that there's also opportunities for tree plantings. Um, probably better idea for trees than a lawn um, in that back area. Um, so any way to work in a tree or two or three um, is, is all positive for the site as a whole um, and more sustainable. So thank you. Any questions, feel free to ask them. Thank you, I appreciate it. Uh, the next uh, speaker will be uh, Colleen Cunningham, which I believe is actually Stort. Yes, thank you. I promised Colleen I'd be positive, and so <laughs> I hope everyone is, is happy about that. I want to say- Sorry, if you could please state your, um, your, your name and address for the record again. Sure. Uh, Stuart Borson, Kensington Park, 73 Thank Kensington you. Park. Um, I want to just echo what, what David Watson and Eugene Benson said. I wholeheartedly agree with what they said, 
this building, you know, I'm glad that it's a commercial building in a commercial area, first of all, after the, the last item on the docket. So it's good to see a commercial building in a commercial area. It's good to see a building that isn't gonna grow to be grotesquely large, so that's good. But this looks to me like they just took the cookie cutter plan that they plant everywhere, including in suburban areas like, like Burlington and Framingham, and they just plunked it right into Arlington. And as uh, you guys noted, they oriented the front of the building to the parking lot um, as if this was next to the Burlington Mall. And, and, and I saw in one of the drawings, Highland Avenue being called out as one of the streets which you know again says that maybe they just took a drawing and they cut and pasted it into this. So I agree that the architects should actually try to design an urban building for a walkable part of Arlington, you know, Arlington Heights. This is a business district in a fairly busy town, and um, the front of the building should be the the main part of the building. Um, I appreciate the want to you know maintain handicap accessibility and that can be done by wrapping the facade, the interesting facade of the building around to the parking lot. Because otherwise what they have right now looks like the side of a warehouse. Um, and then finally my wife reminded me that she agrees wholeheartedly with Eugene and solar um, would be a nice thing to put on the flat roof of this building. It's calling out for solar cells and you know lead certification Come on, Citizens Bank, they have money, they can do better. Thank you very much. Thank you for your comments. Uh, do, is there any other member of the public wishing to speak on uh, this topic tonight? And I'll run through the... I don't see anyone raising their hand either. So seeing none, we will close public comment on this agenda item. Um, before I, Rachel. sorry, please, Jenny. Susan Stamps, I think is, um, she's clapping. <laughs> and I, I believe she may want, want to speak. Oh was, <laughs> oh, was I clapping? I'm sorry. No, it's, um, a, it's a hand, it's a hand. A hand, hand is a hand for me. I apologize. I didn't see your, your video on, my apologies. No, 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 no problem. Thank you. Uh, I got too, too many things going on right here. Um, I just wanted to- I, I'm, I'm so sorry to interrupt. Would you please introduce yourself by first, last name and address? Yeah. Thank you. Uh, Susan Stamps, 39 Grafton Street, town meeting member and also a member of the tree committee, uh, not speaking on behalf of the tree committee. Um, I would echo what Eliza Burden said in terms of adding more trees and also looking at the site design. I see that there is a lot of greenery, but they're all low bushes. And the town has uh, many um, sustainable and regenerative policies, which it's developing and statements and resolutions and statements of intent um, for being a green community and going forward and dealing with climate change. And it seems to me that the redevelopment board is in a great position to use their rules and regulations and lead to um, insist that any redevelopment or new development have a lot of trees. There are many places on that site plan where there are low bushes, which look nice, but they really do almost nothing in terms of uh, capturing carbon for the town and uh, giving people shade. And so um, this is something that's relatively new and to be thinking about it's it's really important when a, de a, a developer is putting so much money into a brand new project and it is 2021 and we're in the just come off of the last several years of being the hottest years on record that to not require mitigation of heat in every way possible just doesn't um, seem like the best policy. So I would encourage the redevelopment board and we will, I know we will be having uh, conversations about this going forward, but here is a development uh, right in front of you where there are things that can be done there. Um, break up the asphalt in the parking lot, put in some trees. You don't need all that parking space. Um, get creative uh, thinking. And that is all I have to say. Thank you, I appreciate um, you guys listening. Thank you very much. Hey, any any other members of the public wishing to speak? 
I don't see any other hands waving at me either. So I'm going to close public comment. Uh, let's see. So why don't I do this? Why don't I run through um, the list of items that I've captured so far uh, from David, Jean, and myself? Uh, that we'd like to to see addressed before uh, before this comes back in front of us, and then David and Jean, I'll open it up to see if there's anything else that I may have missed. So I have. Uh, we would like you to look at reorient reorienting the building entrance to face Massachusetts Avenue, or perhaps adding a second entrance, but an entrance needs to to be on Mass Ave. Um, we also need to look at completing the entire facade to ensure that it is a the major facade of the of the building architecturally. Um, we'd like you to look at potentially reducing the parking uh, for the amount that's actually needed for the, the bank operations and customer needs. Um, and in doing so, look at um, meeting or exceeding the rear site buffer, buffer requirement. Um, we'd like you to provide an interior layout so that again, we can um, see how this, this building engages with Mass Ave, as well as the way that the uh, bikes are brought into the building for long-term uh, storage. We'd like to, to review the lead checklist and see if you can increase your, your score based uh, beyond what's currently shown. We'd like a new sign plan uh, with, there were several revisions that were mentioned, so we'd like those all to be reflected in the uh, most current signage plan. And we'd like you to review opportunities for uh, additional tree planting. Jean and David, what did I miss? Anything? You didn't miss anything, but you know, sometimes we've asked for detailed planting plans, and I just wonder if we should ask for one here. Is it there, Jenny? Correct me if I'm wrong. I know that there was a, this was a very thorough application and I, and I thought I saw a planting plan, but I may have, I may have missed it. There is a planting but, plan and there's also a full sign package in there as right, well. At the end, yeah. At the end of the document. So yeah. is there something more that you want in either of those? I mean, other I than the signage you, plan you probably was, want an updated landscaping plan based on right. this conversation, right. and but yeah. There was so, a, and there's what a signage about plan, an updated signage plan because there were a couple of changes noted during the discussion. Um, okay. Th so you just you just want to see an updated, updated. updated okay. sign and landscaping plan. Got it. Thank you. Aaron, did you want to, was that you, clarification? Good. Rachel, did you get solar? Oh, on I'm sorry, line? David, can, can you just let Aaron answer oh, Jenny's yeah. question first, sorry. Uh, an updated signage plan was submitted. Um, it was not in the combined document because it was submitted um, afterwards and I didn't want to, as it was already posted, I didn't want to mess anything up or confuse anyone that was looking at stuff. So there is an updated sign package that I think spoke to all of the questions that came in during this hearing, namely the removal of the, um, the sign on the drive through facade, um, but if I missed something, I might have been taking notes. Um, so I can review that as well with the applicants. Thanks. I think it'll have to be updated anyway when they move the entrance to to Mass, Mass Ave, just looking at the signage in total. Yes. There. Thank you. Sorry, I cut you off. No, no, my, I jumped in. Uh, did you have uh, solar on the list as well? Uh, yes, I can add that too. In reviewing the lead checklist, also um, um, review any whether whether solar um, makes makes sense for the development as well. I, I don't know if this was on your list, but um, they may not be ready to provide interior floor plans or something along those lines. But perhaps just. Uh, making it clear where the location of the bike storage will be inside. Um, did you mention that? Yes, yes. Okay, all right. So is that, if they and cannot really provide that though, I think just at least telling us where, and then we can make that, we can we need to put that in their conditions. Right, so Tom, I believe I heard from you that you had at least a preliminary floor plan um, that you'd already begun to work on, correct? Yes, that is correct. And, right. and what we can do, is um, show on there where the bike storage will be. Walls right. and some things may be subject to change, but obviously providing the, the bike storage will remain 
as a condition. And I assume even that could move slightly within the building in the future. Great, thank you. All right, I think that's all that I had. David, Jean, anything else before we um, move for a continuation of this, this hearing? Okay, um, so we should look at what date that would uh, best be. So um, knowing that you have a couple of things to, to take a look at, I don't know that March, March 1st, which is what in a week, <laughs> is uh, maybe too soon. So um, Jenny, I think the week after the next meeting after that is the, which meeting? Sorry, I need to pull up my calendar. Well, it's, it's, we're, we have pretty busy evenings on March 15th and 29th, I believe. Um, so I don't think either yeah. one of those evenings would be appropriate to okay. tack this on. Um, yeah. And Aaron, please feel free to yeah. chime in. The 29th, is, I'm looking at the schedule right now. Mm -hmm. I think both of them would be challenging, but could be possible. And April 5th would be very challenging. So I would just add that the public hearings for the uh, town meeting articles begin at 7 p.m. as it, they were advertised. So um, you would have to you'd have to do some scheduling gymnastics um, to fit this in at a decent hour. So that would, if we can't get them in those days, that would push them to. The 19th, but that's when does pub, no 19th is a holiday, correct? March 15th. I thought you said March 15th was not. We don't have a meeting on the 19th. We, um, that's a, that is a holiday. Uh, that is not a holiday, but that, that just wasn't an evening that we chose. Um, so it's. Sorry, I was talking about, I was looking forward into April. So. Oh, okay. Oh, well, that, um, that, that, is, so that is indeed a holiday. Yes. Yes. Sorry. So March 15th is there, there is room on the agenda you mentioned on, on that date or? Uh, March 15th is basically your zoning warrant article hearings and right. they are Extensive. quite packed that evening, I believe is quite busy. Right. So what I'm trying to get to is when is the next available? <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Uh, basically, none of the currently scheduled evenings would be ideal. So you'll you'll probably need to add a meeting in order to accommodate additional hearings. Yeah. Um, if not, then the board will have to just be aware of the fact that you'll have zoning warrant article hearings and then a public uh, a continued public hearing, and it's just not clear exactly what time that public hearing would begin. Right. Could we? So we need to look at the eighth or the twenty second, then. Correct. Could we start one of our meetings at six and start with them at six or is that too early? I, I could make that work. It's up to, up to all of you. David? I'm flexible. So what, time, what date would work for the applicant in March? Yeah, how, how many weeks do you think you would need? To come back. Um, what are the meeting dates? The first or the fifteenth? The well, first is not possible. It's really okay. the fifteenth or the 29th and it would uh, have to be at six p.m. Uh, the time is is fine with us. Would we could do it on the fifteenth at six p.m. Okay. Why don't we plan on that? And we will we'll plan on that pending. Um, confirmation with the members who are not uh what would with ken who isn't uh here this evening so do i hear a motion to uh continue this hearing to the march 15th hearing I'll move. second we'll take a vote gene yes david yes and i am a yes as well so thank you very much. We will uh, see you again at March on March 15th at 6 p.m. Oh, Rachel, just to confirm, if Kim can't do it at 6, then they'll be at the end of the agenda on the 15th, right? Whenever that turns out to be. Correct. Okay. Right. 
Oh, early or late is what mm -hmm. I hear. <laughs> yes. We will do everything we can to make it early because <laughs> it might be a long night. So thank you very much. I appreciate it. Great. Thank you. Okay, so that closes. Uh, oh, sorry, we have one more. So uh, the next item on our public hearing list is uh, docket number 2150 as amended by 2618, 49 to 51 Grove Street. So this is the, uh, the expansion and renovation of the public works department yard. And it uh, looks like we have a few people here to join us this evening. Good evening. Good evening. So Jenny, did you have anything you wanted to uh, say to introduce this, this item before we jump in? No, I, I think I'm gonna defer and let the applicant get going. Great. I, I just need to know where they want me to start um, whenever they do get on. If you could um, start with C501, that's the site drawing, that would be great. Great, well, welcome. If you could introduce yourself and your team, and um, if you could um, try and hit all of the highlights for us, we'll certainly get much more into the details as we uh, get into our questions with you as well. That sounds great. Thank you so much. I know you have a five minute time limit. I have a little stopwatch going here. I'll make sure I stay within that. Much um, sure thing. My name is Jeff Alberti. I am with Weston and Sampson. Uh, with me is David Steves, also from Weston and Sampson, our project architect. And Michael Rademacher is also on as well, the director. At least I saw Michael. Yep. Oh, there he is. So, so a lot of faces on there. Um, so thanks for having us this evening. So I just wanted to provide a brief overview of the project and then obviously get into any questions that you might have. Uh, so the town of Arlington is proposing a new and renovated facility that will support the Department of Public Works, the Inspectional Services Division, the Facilities Department, as well as the IT Department. And this will happen at the existing site uh, located on Grove Street, the existing town yard site. And I just wanted to talk a little bit about what this project entails. It starts with uh, the renovation of four existing structures. And these are on C501. When that's shared, we'll certainly get to it, but I'll just keep talking. Um, oops, looks like it's coming up right now. Thank you very much. Uh, so if you uh, look over to the right-hand side of your drawing, you can see building A, B, C, and D. Those are four existing structures that are in the center of your screen that will be, remain and those will be renovated. And to the left of that, you'll see uh, building E, and that is a new construction, as well as some ancillary support structures, including a salt shed and a new fueling facility. Uh, this project also includes site improvements, including a new stormwater system, uh, stormwater system, which includes the latest DEP best management practices, which is really great for this site. Sites located in an industrial district, I, and municipal public works yard and associated maintenance storage and office facilities are permitted use uh, within this district by special permit. Uh, the site has several uh, unique site conditions and um, Jenny, if you don't mind, could you please go one sheet up to the existing conditions plan or backwards, I should say, I'm sorry, the other direction. Um, so this this will show you the existing conditions plan and. I just wanted to highlight um, that this site is unique, which has really helped to guide our development of this site. And you can see in the center of your, your screen, there's some shaded areas and those represent some MWA, MWRA sewer easements that uh, had to be maintained. And just to the right of those is actually an underground brook, mill brook, which runs directly through the middle of the site. And to the left, you can see some shading in the upper left. That's a high pressure gas main from National Grid and the site itself also has a historic designation. Uh, this project has been submitted to the Massachusetts Historic Commission, and we've also uh, presented before the Arling Arlington Historic Commission and Mass Historic Commission has found that the project has no adverse effect. And based on the historic use of this site, the site also being a former gas manufacturing plant uh, has historic contamination throughout the site. And as a result, the site includes a direct contact barrier or an engineered barrier to provide some separation between that historic contamination. Uh, we've outlined the special permit requests within our project statement, so I won't go over those. I know you've probably had a chance to read them, 
Uh, I did want to mention that the new building does maintain its position along the street edge for a continuous street front elevation consistent with the other buildings on Grove Street. And uh, we've really worked on the scale and massing so that it fits in, as well as the use of materials. And we took advantage of the fabric of the site with the use of some terracotta tile because that material is employed and used on the existing Arlington Gas Works building that will remain. Uh, the new building has been designed to meet LEED Silver and based on our review of the current conditions, the proposed development as outlined in our application, we feel will not result in any adverse impacts to the town or the neighborhood. In fact, we feel the proposed development will be an overall improvement for the town and the neighborhood by constructing what will be a properly sized, safe and efficient facility for town employees and will also serve the public. And it also includes the necessary improvements to be an environmentally conscientious facility for the Department of Public Works and the associated departments. And finally, a notice of intent was filed with the Conservation Commission and the project has been approved and an order of conditions has been received by the Conservation Commission, which went through a detailed review of the improved stormwater system for the site. And at that point, I will turn it back over to you for any detailed questions. I know there were some comments um, in the staff letter and we're happy to address those as appropriate. Great, thank you very much for your presentation and for the thorough uh, package that was submitted, I appreciate it. Uh, I'll turn it over to uh, Jean first for any questions or comments. Thank you. Yeah, it looks like it's gonna be a wonderful project and something that I think will do the town proud. Um, I, most of my questions relate to what was in the staff's public memo and then a couple others. One was the clarification of the need for the 135 parking spaces. Would you speak to that, please? Sure. Uh, so within that 135 parking spaces, uh, it is set up to support the staff. That includes um, 67 for DPW. It also has seven for ISD and 20 for the IT department and 15 for facilities. So that's a total of 109. On top of that, we've included five handicapped parking spaces, as well as some visitor parking spaces, seven visitor parking spaces. Uh, and also within that is, are some town vehicles that will be stored on site outside another 14. That made up the total of the 135. Great, thank you. And the bicycle parking that was mentioned? Yeah, so bicycle parking, uh, we didn't get into the details of it, but the project currently includes um, three We've provided three three loop wave exterior bike racks, which are capable of storing up to five bicycles each. Uh, that'll provide the short term bike parking. So 15 uh, bike parking spaces. And then within building E, we've provided for uh, five, uh, an interior five bike angled rack, similar to those manufactured, if you're familiar with um, peak bicycle racks. So we've, we've provided an alcove off of the accessible corridor uh, on the building to provide this additional interior long-term uh, bicycle storage. Yeah, I'm not familiar with the racks, but maybe David is, so I'll let him speak to the racks. Um, my, that's all very helpful, thanks. Um, I guess just a couple of others, and, and you heard, if you were on before, I'm going to sound like a broken record in a couple <laughs> of ways. One is, New buildings, flat roofs, great opportunities for solar. And I think, you know, the town really has an opportunity to model what we want other commercial and industrial buildings to be in town. So I think it would be great to take a look at that, maybe to coordinate with the town energy manager on that. Um, I think it would be a big plus for the town. Um, uh, do you want me to address that or let you sure. go through your comments? No, no, go right ahead. Oh, sure. We, um, we actually met with the town energy manager early on in the process and continued throughout this. And so the entire roof has been de designed to be solar ready. Uh, that includes providing uh, penetrations through the roof so that in the future that can be added as well as uh, locating and designating uh, locations inside for the associated equipment that would be required. So that's all been accounted for in the design. We just haven't incorporated the actual solar so that there's opportunities to do a, a power purchase agreement or other provisions but the structure is designed for that T terrific do you think that's going to happen i mean i know you'll make it solar ready but will the solar go on at any reasonable time uh, we don't have a 
a fixed plan for that at the moment. I can tell you that uh, for the last five or eight years, we've been designing our roof systems for very similar facilities to be solar ready. And uh, as we keep going back and looking at them, we're finding solar being added to them when uh, the time is right and uh, it makes economical sense. So I would imagine that this roof will have in the future. Can I ask Mr. Rademacher if he has any thoughts about going solar sooner rather than later on the building? Sure. Yeah, this is Mike Rademacher, uh, Director of Public Works. We fully intend to pursue it, you know, as as quickly as we can with um, Ken's help. You know, I, I know they have certain kind of lease agreements with the schools um, and I and we may end up doing the same exact thing. Uh, we'll, we'll work very cooperatively with him to get something as soon as possible. Sounds terrific. Um, and also, I know you can't plant on most of this because of the barrier. I just wondered about the possibility of street trees out on Grove Street and whether you've talked to the tree warden about the possibility of those. So we have um, provided four street trees along Grove Street. You can see that in the, in the image there. Uh, so we tried to maximize wherever we could put any plantings. Um, we certainly did that. So we have uh, made provisions to the maximum extent practicable. And I guess the last thing which was I have, which was also in the staff memo was about the three parking spaces in front of the building. I wonder how necessary they are considering that there are parking spaces right nearby on both sides. Yeah, we thought that from a uh, operational, a safe, really more of a safety perspective uh, for people that are coming to quickly uh, work with ISD, the Inspectional Services Department, instead of having to access the site to provide that uh, ease of access out front uh, also, there are students that are sometimes dropped off in this area, so this provides a, a safer area that is off of the main road. Is, is the front door in Building E on Grove Street, too? Does it face the road? It does. Uh, right, uh, yeah, you can see the little entrance symbol. It's in the top left-hand corner. So will at least one of those spots out front be handicap accessible? It currently is not um, shown for that just to, in order to meet the dimensional requirements, but we've provided one immediately once you enter the okay. site. Great, um, that's all I've got, thank you. You're Looks welcome. like it's gonna be a nice project for the town. Thank you, Gene. David? Uh, I think uh, the project is, is gonna be great for the town, uh, as Gene said, and long overdue. Uh, I think you've responded to most of my questions uh, already. With respect to the bike parking, uh, the outside bike parking, I think you mentioned wave, a wave rack. And uh, if, that's, if that's the rack I'm thinking of, then that is actually not compliant with the town's bicycle parking guidelines. And I'd uh, urge you to to uh, pick a different design uh, for the outdoor bike parking. Yes, I heard uh, the discussion earlier about a change that was made and I started to do some reading in the meantime. Uh, so I will certainly circle back and we'll make sure that the selected product meets that requirement. So I was right. able to yeah. find some information, we'll get that fixed. Yeah, we've, we've got an excellent bike parking guide and uh, I, I think uh, that will have all the information you need. And also uh, peak racks make several different designs of racks and uh, whichever one you're, you're thinking of using for the indoor bike parking, uh, also make sure that that's compliant with our guidelines. Sounds great, I'll check that. Other than that, uh, you know, I understand the, the issue of the site conditions and um, that you've done uh, as much as you can with respect to greenery. Um, you know, it's, it's too bad that there can't be more, but uh, it's understandable. Um, I, I, um, I would like, if possible, um, to uh, think about a handicapped space as, as one of those spaces in the front, um, because it, it won't necessarily be obvious to someone entering uh, the site that they, well, that they need to enter the site in order to access a handicapped spot. All right. 
I will definitely uh, look into that. I, I think that was that was it. Uh, I don't want to be repetitive with with Jean's uh, other questions. Great, thank you, David. So um, I'll actually ask a few questions that are more about the um, architecture of the new proposed uh, building. So Jenny, I'm not sure if you could pull up the one of the facade um, drawings or one of the the renderings. Um, but what I really wanted to, to ask about, um, and I appreciate you providing so much information, both in terms of the photos of the existing buildings and the context, the, the massing models of the entire site, um, and as well the, um, the materials. I, I think the terracotta works really well with the, um, with the beautiful brick buildings um, that, that are currently on the site. What I just wanted to, to speak to is the way that the new building speaks to the existing buildings architecturally, specifically um, because the existing buildings um, really rely so much in their language on um, emphasizing the verticality and the, the bays of the building through vertical elements um, and through kind of a, a articulation and change in, in volume based on the, the, the function of the, of the space. Um, so can you, can you talk a little bit about the kind of design intent for this, this building here, which, which seems very much um, more um, linear and horizontally focused in, in design as opposed to, again, I think every other building on the site, which is very much set up in, in kind of a beautiful repetitive uh, bay structure. So I am gonna, I'm glad that he's here. I'm gonna turn, turn this over to David Steves, our lead architect, uh, I'm a civil you. engineer. So you probably don't wanna hear from me. I'll definitely let Dave uh, speak to that. <laughs> no, I, no, I appreciate it. Oh, I'm sorry. Sure. Rachel, um, Jenny had to step away, so I'm driving. Um, so if, if there's a better, um, uh, page to go to, please let me know, um, Mr. Steve. I think this is a good one to, to start on. Yep. Okay. Uh, so yes, essentially, um, this is quite the, one of the early challenges of the project was that it is the historic buildings are a series of small four to 5,000 square foot buildings. And, um, the, there's a larger original, um, historic building to the rear of the site that was added to over time. And so the challenge was this is over a 40,000, 43,000 square foot facility and mostly a uh, ground floor facility. So um, in terms of how do we site it and integrate it into the, to the, to the fabric and character of the existing um, facility was one of the early challenges and why we made some of our um, larger and more important uh, design decisions. And one is the massing by having, um, as you can see, we have uh, a two-story administration, administrative portion of this structure to the front of the site. So it carries the street edge of the massing of the, of the building um, uh, along Grove Street. So you have a continuous street edge and roof eave edge is continuous uh, pretty comparably to the, the original uh, gas work structure along Grove. So it kind of harkens back to um, the emphasis being on this frontis piece without incorporating the larger 30 plus thousand square feet of the industrial portion of the building, which is located to the more rear of the site. So uh, the, the focus here on massing and articulation of this uh, volume was um, one of our most important emphasis of um, the design. And as you can see, the it's more articulated uh, with punched openings, similar to um, what was done historically. Um, it is a little bit more, it's a little, so it makes acknowledgements to the existing fabric in scale and size um, and its uh, siting. Um, but we didn't want to copy what was there. We used some of the materials. We knew early on it being an industrial, really an industrial facility, we wouldn't be able to articulate a lot of the corbeling and detailing and the 
the beautiful original brickwork of those old buildings. So we, that was uh, an early challenge. How is it, um, how does it speak to and, heart, and relate to without copying? So uh, that, that was our design approach. Um, it, it, is a, um, it is a contemporary structure and meets um, a lot of our functional design uh, focuses, which was trying to maximize uh, the natural light and getting light to the interior of the, of the spaces. It doesn't seem like it um, from this view, but it is quite a sizable building. So getting light deep into the building is a, is a challenge here. Um, by making it uh, for the user more welcoming and more open and have an engaging uh, street edge activity that we wanted to uh, um, relate a little bit more to this building than the historic buildings had. Although it, it does have, you can see we have a very glassy front first floor, which is a very public space and engages the sidewalk and activity along the street. So it's not just a, a flat wall. The original uh, uh, building A, uh, uh, the Gasworks building along Grove Street had an open archway in the very center of the building. So uh, it does have some historical connotations, but in a, in a newer uh, context and use. Great, thank, thank you. I, I certainly appreciate that. And I understand the challenge of, of um, not wanting to be too referential to uh, the existing buildings, given the fact that it is a new industrial building. Um, I, I, I think that as I'm looking at this though, it's, um, it's hard to make any connection at, at all in terms of the way that it's, it's currently um, designed, except for the, the material, you know, the coloration and the materiality there and um, I I like the contemporary elements again of having at this this corner um, which which is your main entrance and I think actually you can't really tell from this view but I think at both corners you're trying to drive light through by having these um, these these glass double height um, atrium spaces um, but what what, what I really appreciate about the historic buildings and the additions that were added to them is some of the, the, the break in the, in the massing. Um, so in some of these spaces where, where we do have these, um, what I'm sure will be really wonderful spaces to, to be in these, these large uh, double height uh, atrium spaces and, um, and the, Large expanse of glass that you have over the entry. Um, if there if there is a way to um, articulate by pulling out or or up um, in some way to 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 break the solid um, the the solid plane that we have uh, running in in both directions, there uh, that's something that I I'd, I'd very much like like to see. Um, I, I'm not sure if that's something you've explored, but. Um, I think that that would, to Jean's question too about where's the entry here, I think that that would um, certainly um, help articulate the entry and also reference back to some of the massing of the, the original buildings as well. Um, and then I'm also trying to see at the storefront, does that, is that a faceted fa facade? Um, does, does that kind of jog in and out a bit? I was trying to, to read it from the, from the rendering there. Yes, yes, it does. It, there's a very slight uh, facet to that wall. So in, in, in earlier um, iterations of the design, it was, um, it, it was glassy, but uh, flat, and it was just really uh, dead on the front of the facade, yeah. and it didn't really engage the, the right. street or any. I, I'm, I see what you're trying to do there, and I certainly appreciate the, um, it, attempt, the intent of um, trying to drive some additional visual interest through um, creating some shadow, shade, you know, e even <laughs> small shadow there. Yep. Um, I, I'm, I'm wondering, though, if it wouldn't be more um, successful to introduce some sort of a, and again, it doesn't need to be the same size base as what we're looking at 
in the um, in the existing historic buildings. But if we if we actually do add some verticality, some some depth in between some of the sections that traverses the entire height of the of the building, I, I just don't know that you're going to pick up that slight faceting to to accomplish what um, I appreciate that you're trying to accomplish here, which is to um, to drive some visual interest and to break up this this long run of, of storefront we we have running here. Um, so I, I think those are those are the two things that I, I'm really looking for here and that I'm been missing are trying to pull some of the um, the verticality and the creation of, of bays in a in a more modern way. You know, obviously not in a completely um, referential way to the uh, existing historic construction and to 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 find those moments to pull out or up to to identify where you do have some spaces that that are programmed differently because that's certainly where again a lot of the 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 beautiful pitched roofs and clear story that we have in the other building um, occurs so without you know, again, being referential and adding a clear story and pitch roofs to the to this building. Is there another way to um, to create some some visual interest in in the in the building and also again just break up these long runs of um, flat flat wall space? Um, because again, I, I think the, the the existing buildings are so beautiful and so dynamic. We really want this building to to continue um, that that same that same language. Yeah. So that that's that's my um, that's the the only commentary that I wanted to to add here. Uh, Jean and, and David, did you have any other um, thoughts before we move to public comment, David? I had a couple of. Uh, additional related questions. Um, so I think you were talking about the indoor bike parking as being located I, I, in, a, in a maintenance bay or something like that. It's in the um, in the shop. It's in a common corridor that accesses okay. the shop and maintenance areas. OK, in the so, corridor, actually. so I, I, I think in terms of trying to encourage folks to to bike to work. Um, I, I think having it in an area like that, I, I think is is really good for folks who might uh, come come to the DPW yard in the morning, but then be deployed off site somewhere or or be working in the maintenance areas behind behind the scenes. But I think for the folks who work in the office complex, parts of the site, it would be more desirable to have uh, secure indoor bike parking uh, where their offices are rather than, than in, in some centralized location. Uh, so I, uh, I know there's a lot going on on the site uh, and uh, there's probably not as much space for things as, as it looks like, but uh, if you can think a little bit more about how that might be accomplished to give people that option. And then alongside that, uh, something that I didn't see on the plan, but I could have missed because there's a lot going on there, is uh, it's very helpful to have uh, shower and changing facilities uh, for people who are bike commuting. And I, I didn't know whether that was available on the site. Yes, we do have shower and changing facilities within the building. OK, uh, where, where is that? Uh, Let's see. Um, do you want to look at the floor plan or just a general description? Uh, whatever, whatever's easier. <laughs> it's in that front uh, portion of that building that you were looking at um, when we were looking at the rendering earlier. So where where all the folks will enter the building with, right next to the employee entrance, so staff can come in and access that locker shower and toilet facility. Is that in building E? Building E. Yes. Sorry. Okay. All right. Oh, yeah, I see it now. Okay. All right, so that responds to that question. 
but um, in terms of thinking about citing some indoor bike parking uh, in uh, uh, more convenient to the office areas of the site, that's something I'd like you to look at. Okay, thanks. And Rachel, I had forgotten one thing, which was also in um, the memo from staff, which is details about the signage that's proposed for um, 51 Grove so that you know whether it meets the sign requirements. Yes, we saw that and um, yeah. we checked the different uh, regulations to confirm 631. I believe it was um, building signage, canopy signage, as well as monument signage and uh, all of that's in compliance. But what we'll do is assemble that into a sheet right. and submit that. Terrific. Great, thank you. All right, uh, with that, I will uh, open this up for public comments. Uh, so any member of the public wishing to uh, speak uh, about this project, please use the raise hand function at the bottom of your screen. And I'll call on you in the order uh, that the hands are raised. So as a reminder, please state your first and last name and address, and you will have uh, three minutes to speak. Uh, so the first uh, speaker will be uh, Colleen Cunningham and Stuart. Hi, thank you. Yeah, Stuart Borson, 73 Kensington Park. Colleen is sitting right next to me here. Um, so yeah, I'm going to keep this very positive. I'm very pleased uh, by this. It's, you know, to me, the architects have done a job, a great job. They've designed a building for the site. Um, they respect the adjacent historic building, which by the way, is the old Arlington Gas Works building. We actually, produced gas here in Arlington, coal gas. Um, and anyway, I won't go into that story, that's historical. Uh, the building faces the street, you know, everything that this building does is, um, stands in great contrast to that, that Citizens Bank building where they just basically took the corporate cutty, cookie cutter building and plopped it into, um, you know, Arlington Heights. But I have one question and, and it may, you know, expose my vast ignorance and that's, that's fine, but the building is uh, lead silver, but I noticed that, or, and correct me if I'm wrong, the windows are not openable. And, and that sort of, it means that everyone relies on a, um, a central air conditioning system for ventilation. And I know that this is how things are done these days, um, but it just doesn't seem right to me that you can't actually open your window, particularly in the area of COVID when, you know, fresh air is, is so important. Um, can you comment on, you know, openable windows and, and whether or not that's feasible for a building like this? I understand maybe the first floor you have security uh, questions, but on upper floors, why not be able to open a window and get fresh air? Thank um, you. At, actually at all the office, so punched opening windows, we do have an operable vent in, every storefront window system. So in every office and personnel space, there is an operable window. So I, I definitely agree with your sentiment on having the ability to open a window and get some fresh air. So that's a real, when you say vent, that means that it's actually a little section of window. Yeah, it's, it's not a, an old fashioned lift up uh, hung window, it's a, it, it's a casement. So it will, it swings open. Um, okay, like at the town hall in the 50s edition of the town hall. Yes. Sort of like that. Fantastic. Thank you. You're welcome. Great. Thank you. Uh, any other members of the public wishing to comment on this submission? All right. Seeing none, I will close a uh, public comment. I'll just double check the screens, make sure no one's waving at me. I don't see anyone. <laughs> okay. Um, so I will uh, ask Jean and David if you have any uh, further questions, and then I will run through the list of items that um, that I have here on my list to follow up on. Nothing from me. Nothing further. Okay, great. So um, I'll just run through the the list of uh, questions for follow up that that I have here on my list. Um, the first is to um, provide an updated bike parking specification for both the interior and the uh, exterior bike parking. Um, to also look at the location of the bike parking in the building so that it's easily accessible to the office areas. Um, the second is to um, 
to provide uh, details about the signage for uh, the new building for building E. And uh, the last is to look at the architectural elements of the uh, newly proposed building uh, to see if there are opportunities to break up the um, long runs of the flat facade. Did I miss anything? Jean? I, I don't know if um, Jeff said this or not, that at least one of the three spaces that are in front of the building would be handicapped accessible. Right, to look into whether that's feasible. Yes, thank you, I missed that one. Just make a note. It's parallel spaces. Anything else? Great, uh, Jeff and team, did you have any further questions for us? I uh, do not. I guess uh, we probably should select the date. Is that correct? Good. That's the next That's what I to do on our list here. Let's see. So I think we'd probably be looking at um, a 6 p.m. slot again, right, Jenny? On either the yeah. 29th. I, yeah, the first probably isn't going to give you enough time. Um, so I think the 29th is probably the next available time slot, correct? Yes. So does 6 p.m. on the 29th work for you and your team? That works for me, yes. Okay, and again, that will be contingent. We just need to confirm that with um, with the other member of the board who is not with us this, this evening. Oh, okay. I, I can't do 6 p.m. on that night. Can't do 6 p.m. on that day. Okay. Maybe they'll have to be at the end of the agenda. Right? Well, I mean, the other the other option we have is to to add a short meeting on the twenty second, and we could always add the other um, go back and potentially add the other um, the the previous item to that as well. I'm available on the 22nd. I say with regret. <laughs> and I hate to add another meeting, but at the same time, I also know that those will be very long meetings. David, your, your thoughts on adding another meeting to capture these two continued? Uh, um, I may have an issue on the 22nd. Uh, and uh, I have an appointment I need to keep. And yeah. I'm not sure okay. how I'm going to feel afterwards. No, I, totally understandable. So, <clears throat> can we put them at the end of the agenda on the 29th? We could. I, I'll apologize in advance. It's going to be a long, long night, Jeff and team. So, that's all right. I enjoyed listening to you guys tonight. So it was okay. interesting. So, so no, no worries. Anything after a. <laughs> okay, so let's plan on, um, we'll, we'll work on the agenda for the 29th. And if there's anything we can do to, um, you know, to, to, to move that up in the agenda, we'll do that. But um, we'll work on, on the timing for that with you. Okay, that sounds great. Okay. Yeah, at this point on the 29th, you have Everything starts at 7 p.m. and it is a it's a that's a packed evening, so you would not be able to get huh. these folks on until possibly 9 p.m. Not in anything, or even later. Uh, just looking at the the rundown. In COVID days, I can sit here and get a lot of work done. So no worries on our behalf. We'd be happy to sit and watch, and we'll wait wait until you're ready. As long as you guys are up for it, I know that that's a long night for you, but we can make it easy on you. What's another 20, 30 minutes at that point? Right. <laughs> <laughs> okay, uh, great. So uh, do I hear a motion to continue um, this agenda item to the 29th of March? So moved. Second. Uh, so we'll take a roll call vote. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. I am a yes as well. So thank you all for being here this evening and uh, we look forward to seeing you on the 29th. Thanks for having us. Appreciate it. Thank you. Good night. Thank you. Thank you. All right. Uh, 
So that closes our public hearings and agenda item one. So we will now move to agenda item two, which is an update on the special permits that were issued by the redevelopment board from 2016 to 2021. So Jenny, I'll turn it over to you. <laughs> sure, well, this was actually an agenda item requested by Ken. <laughs> so um, I'm glad to answer any questions about this very you know, basic memo that just simply outlines the project address and the status of whether or not something was built or installed or it's in progress. Um, and this is representative of uh, the board's permitting from 2016 through 2020. I'm glad to do that, or we could wait for an evening when Ken is present. I, I mean, Ken asked for this, so I'd suggest putting it to a meeting where he's present in case there's any questions about any of it. Sure, we can do that. Um, sense, I thought it would be helpful. Right. So given our, our packed agenda is coming through, I don't think that this is an urgent item by any means. So I think that we'll, we'll look for an agenda item after we get through the warrant article hearings to revisit this then. But thank you very much for pulling it together. <coughs> You're welcome. <laughs> no problem. Great. David, we can't hear you. Were you trying to say something? Hello. Okay. Now we can hear you. You're very faint. All right. Um, can you hear me now? Yes, we can. Okay. Um, I just wanted to say uh, I was pleasantly surprised that uh, that progress has been made on so many of the projects, uh, and there were really very few where where uh, things have not progressed. That was it. Great. All right, so we will um, reschedule our discussion on this topic for a future meeting. So the next uh, item on our agenda is to uh, review the zoning warrant article public hearing schedule. Um, and Jenny and Aaron, I will turn this over to you because I know you both put in a lot of work to compile all of these and to uh, create a, a schedule for us. Yep, so um, I'll just, I'll start and Aaron can chime in, but basically I shared with the board the, um, the legal notice that we issued that's already out there um, with regard to all of our public hearings. Um, as you can see here, they, here they are at the time that we filed this, obviously we didn't have the warrant article numbers. The warrant is to be posted from what we understand by tomorrow, it sounds like. Um, so we, uh, you know, we can, we, we will have, when we have the agendas as we've done in the past, we'll note the actual article number. Um, but essentially, as you can see, uh, the next meeting is the beginning of the warrant article hearings. And you'll see that on the first night, it's, uh, there's some repetition from your very first hearing of last year, March 3rd. Sorry for the anniversary, but it just is what it is. <laughs> so, um, We'll just leave that there. And then you've got a couple of new things, uh, the marijuana uses, um, a lot of the administrative uh, changes that we've talked about already. So I think, you know, the next meeting is, is mostly that plus the continued hearing. And uh, I'm hoping to have actually the MOU for the um, Arlington Redevelopment Board and 23 Maple Street tenant, um, which they've now left this meeting, but that's the DPW and basically the, with the town of Arlington. <laughs> so, um, because it constitutes actually three different departments, which you could see on the plan, it's IT um, as well as DPW and inspectional services because IT is actually moving from the high school as well and needs space. 
So, um, so I'm, I'm still working on that. I had hoped that it was going to be done this evening, but unfortunately it wasn't ready. So uh, hopefully that'll be for next week as well. And then March 15th, we have um, a number of hearings as well. As you can see, we're gonna talk about the foundations. We thought that that would be a, the, a good article to talk about before we discuss the energy efficient homes on non-conforming lots, since that also addresses foundations. <laughs> um, specifically called out in the article, and then followed by a percentage to increase the affordable housing uh, requ uh, requirement in our inclusionary bylaw, the accessory dwelling unit article, and uh, the non-conforming uses, or I'm sorry, affordable housing on privately owned parcels of non-conforming size is the name of the uh, zoning amendment. We'll talk about that as well. So that's March 15th. And then March 29th, we have the uh, multifamily zoning for MBTA communities, which may not take very long, uh, but followed by the teardown moratorium, uh, which is about, uh, from what we understand, about uh, a moratorium on uh, any uh, demolitions of older, small, affordable houses, as you can see here in the language. Um, and during that time to uh, understand, uh, we think, uh, a method of protecting uh, these types of homes. So we will, we are still learning more about that. Erin has been following up quite diligently with all of the petitioners to get as much information as we can in advance of the hearings. Um, and also just to make sure that the petitioners are prepared for the hearings themselves. Um, then we have a repeat article from last year, which is uh, the side yard sky exposure planes, um, followed by parking minimums, which uh, is James Fleming, who came to the board and talked about this uh, potentially before filing it. Um, then we have uh, two articles that came to us uh, through the select board or by the disability commission via the select board which are for a combination of uh, requirements uh, that would address accessibility uh, standards and parking for accessibility. And then the last evening is April 5th, where we wanted to focus on the industrial uses, um, which is the industrial zoning um, amendments that have been part of the economic analysis of industrial zoning districts um, study that we've been working on followed by what is actually just the, a date change for the zoning map um, in the bylaw, which uh, there's a section of our bylaw that simply has the wrong date related to our zoning map so that we can show that it's been appropriately up to date. We need to change that. And so that's, that's pretty much everything on the agenda for those nights with the exception of the continued hearings that you now have before you. Um, so Erin, is there anything else to add about these hearings that you want to make note of? Uh, no, I don't have anything else to add. Um, like Jenny said, I've been in touch with all of the petitioners, um, or at least have sent um, emails to all the petitioners um, offering any sort of technical assistance I can offer, um, providing a link to that process and timeline that we had looked at at the end of January, um, and then just offering, you know, whatever I can do to help, um, and then setting deadlines um, so that we we receive materials and can post it with the agenda, um, so that the redevelopment board and others that join us those nights are um, uh, fully up to date. So um, I will also just note that. Everything that we have received to date has been compiled into a document that's posted on the ARB's page, it's dated February 11th. Um, so if the members are curious um, and want to see material that might have been, um, uh, in particular, um, those articles from 2020 that have been deferred to this year um, to just uh, get a, um, can't think of the word, but uh, a reminder of what um, those were from last year. You can take a look at that document. Great, thank you. And so we'll review all of those. And then I believe on the first uh, 
is also when we will um, we will we will run through and, and vote on each one of the the articles that's on that agenda for the first as well correct uh, or is that the for fifth. the, the yeah. fifth sorry the fifth no that, that's okay yep the, the on the fifth at the end of that you'll uh, close the hearings and then uh, deliberate and potentially vote um, which will help us to then develop the uh, report to town meeting so we actually will need another meeting in April to vote on that. Um, I think we talked about this previously. We can we can come back to that at another point, but we will need to schedule another here uh, meeting date to vote on the report. Great. And then uh, so that that's those are all of your that's a that's everything ahead for the next four meetings. But I also wanted to report back uh, with Rachel. We uh, joined uh, John Hurd as the chair of the select board with Adam Chapdelay and the town manager, and um, as well as Doug Heim. And we talked about the, we, we uh, discussed this issue of the select board providing some feedback on zoning articles and vice versa, the, the ARB providing some comments to the select board on some town bylaw, the proposed town bylaw amendments or resolutions or, or any number of things. And so I do wanna also share that. It looks like Jean, you've got your hand raised. So I don't know if you wanna, we can pause here before I talk about that, if that would be helpful. Yeah, I wanted to go back to the topic that we were just talking about, which were yeah. the dates and the zoning bylaw amendments. And, you know, I know this is a crazy busy time adding this on top of everything else. My request is, that at least for our articles, that we get the main motions more than a day or two or three or four in advance. So we have time to look at them because, you know, that's been a challenge in some other years where we've gotten them at the same time that the public has gotten them for public comment and we were making comments the same time the public did. And the hope was this time that the board would be reviewing a draft of the main motion. So when we went to the public hearings on them, they would have at least been vetted once through the board. And I'm not sure how that's gonna happen with this schedule, but I hope it can. So um, so as, as we mentioned, um, Aaron has been in touch or is trying to get in touch with every single petitioner We've also explained the timeline and when we need things in a timely way. And we, you know, we've honestly, that, that's, that is the very best that we can do. Um, and this, uh, this is the document that Aaron was referencing, which is basically similar to what we've been using now, I think a number of, number of town meetings at this point, um, which, is, which is on line. This is what we can uh, update as we receive things. I think that at this point it's, frozen in time from February 11th, but this is what we're going to con you know, continue to use as we receive any information from petitioners. And uh, I, I think at this point, that's, if we have anything new to, to share for uh, the next meeting, we of course can do that. I don't think we have anything new for March 1st, Aaron. Yeah, I, I, mean, I think that's really helpful and I know you know, it's not necessarily easy to get people to give us things far in advance. I'm wondering if all of the bylaws that the ARB has put in has the main motion wording. Oh in yeah, it. yes. Everything, so, everything that yeah. we've done has. A, yeah, we're okay. we're all set. We've met our okay. we've met our own standards. Okay, great. Um, thankfully, so um, you know, I don't unless I'm missing something, I, I don't think that there's anything further for us. We're really just trying to reach out to petitioners. And uh, um, you know, part of the issue is the warrant itself has not been posted yet. Right. That's, that's part one of a, an issue. And two is um, sometimes working with petitioners to understand what it is that they need to provide us with um, yeah. seems to continually be uh, challenging to communicate um, that their warrant article is not the same right. as the amendment to the zoning bylaw. And they will often need assistance from our staff to understand what that 
means. And so Aaron does a wonderful job of making sure that people understand both what they need to do and why, um, but we can only, that's, that's the best we can offer. And where is Aaron, this, on the, is there, where is this just, on the website now? Uh, it's on the ARB's page. And it's okay, so if you, it's, it's right, um, I see. where was I? It's over here, right on your, right mm -hmm. on your page. Um, right. So it's, you could see when I just changed, yep. right? Yeah. Yep. So it's under 2021 annual town meeting. It's the first document here. Great, thank you so much. It's terrific. And, and it looks like this. Just and, to follow up on that, yeah. I, I think this goes back to our earlier, our discussion uh, a couple of meetings ago about um, communicating to the public uh, about the desirability of engaging with us early in the process so that we can have some, some discussion as we have had with, with a couple of the proponents this time around, um, because that, that I think will, will make for better articles. And, uh, you know, when we get to the hearing, uh, we're not, we're not uh, surprised by what we see, uh, which may make it less likely for us to to vote to move things forward if, if we haven't seen them. So. Yeah, and um, I think that sometimes petitioners recognize that that lack of communication may be a problem. So, um, you know, and um, they do their very best to describe what they're looking to do um, in greater detail, but unfortunately that's going to happen at a public hearing at this point. Yeah. Uh, one last calendar thing, and um, could you send me or maybe all of us uh, just the the document with all the meeting dates for this year on it? Um, oh yeah, um, I, I think it was in in one of the agendas, but I don't want to look for it. I no, I was going to say I think actually is that that might be on your page as well, but I will I'll send it around. Thank you. Yep, you're welcome. And you're only scheduled out through like June. Yep, I think we only did the first six months. Yeah. So are there, did you, Rachel, did you have any other questions about those upcoming nights or should we I, migrate over to? I didn't, do you wanna to return to the topic you had started to, to, to yeah. discuss about our meeting? <laughs> yeah, no problem. So we ran through the draft warrant as it was when we met, which has not dramatically changed from what will be posted tomorrow. And we discussed uh, four articles that we think it would be great to have the board weigh in on. And I'll just run through them, but I want you to keep in mind that we're gonna have to tack this on to one of those other meetings as well, because the, the select board is of course having their own meetings to talk about warrant articles throughout the next month as well. Um, so we're gonna, if we're needing to provide them with comments in the form of a memo from myself on behalf of the board. Uh, we'll have to have time baked into some of our future agendas that we've just talked about to have these discussions. So the, those four articles that we talked about are as follows. The first one is uh, article seven, which is a rock removal requirement, um, maybe, Jean and David, or only David, I'm trying to remember, this was 2017 special town meeting in, the, in December. We had a proposal for rock removal and talked about it and we voted no action at that time. Um, so it, it might, might predate your time. I thought that you were both, both participating at that point, but um, this is actually being filed by the town um, to, uh, by the select board in order to address the issue of rock removal uh, by way of uh, chipping, uh, instead of chipping using blasting methods. Um, and so there will be, there's some opportunity there for the board to weigh in on that. Um, I can talk about any of these things a little bit more based on what I know right now, if you want. Article 11 is stormwater management. We had actually talked about this last year. This is basically the update to the stormwater bylaw that. <laughs> that would hopefully address so many issues that come up so frequently because we clearly need to update the stormwater bylaw. We also need to be in compliance with the, um, you know, the MS4 uh, permitting process as we've also talked about in the past. So that was actually a holdover from 2020 annual town meeting that's returning. 
um, and is also being worked on by our staff with engineering. Um, the other one is um, Article 27, which is the real estate transfer fee. Uh, this was something that we had discussed also from annual town meeting 2020. In uh, we talked about it at the same time as talking about the affordable housing trust. As you can see, the two, <laughs> the two happened at, in, at a different time. We already adopted the affordable housing trust fund. Uh, now we're having this converse, the continued conversation about the real estate transfer fee and Aaron has been leading these conversations. We're actually having a forum on this uh, next week. So I, what, no, yes, yeah. next week. Yeah, sorry, it's, it blends all together on March 4th in the evening. So we'll send you some details about that so that you, and if you can't attend, it'll be rec uh, recorded. So anybody can of course uh, view that. But we thought it would be helpful to get your, just since you participated in the joint meeting with the select board to talk about housing issues and this came up as well as the, the uh, trust fund and you didn't have an opportunity to comment on the trust fund and I think you probably would have wanted to but unfortunately timing was so compressed with special town meeting in the fall so we'd like to give you that opportunity um, and then um, the last one is there's a committee on res uh, residential development for R0 through R4 that is being proposed this was also from annual town meeting in 2020 that's back and we think uh, also sharing um, the board's point of view on that would be valuable. And then from a, just for a second, the select board is planning to provide some comments on the industrial uses, energy efficient homes and ADUs. So before your hearing or what, by the time you have those hearings, you will have some feedback from the select board on those three articles in the form of a memo. Um, so that that's, I think that's all I have um, on the sort of back and forth between the boards. Um, I did actually provide some comments to the board this evening in the form of a very short memo about the Broadway corridor design competition <laughs> that may interest you since you reviewed the MIT students work on the Broadway corridor. Um, you may recall that Barbara Thornton uh, submitted a resolution for as a warrant article. And so that was actually being, that is being discussed still this evening at the select board meeting. And I provided just a quick, you know, stating that the board had actually, you know, had the students come to the meeting. It was well received. There was good positive feedback. The board is interested in Broadway corridor and making sure that we address some of the issues um, there, but um, I'd be glad to talk about that further as well. Um, that's all that I have from my notes. Rachel, is there anything else you want to add? Uh, no, I mean, I, I think you covered you covered it all. Really, the select board is looking for um, you know any commentary, specifically if um, we'd be looking to to endorse any of these particular articles uh, based on our experience and our um, the way that we interact with with these, these items differently than, than they do. Jean. So when and how do we make those comments to the select board and when and how do they make their comments to us on the warrant articles that Jenny mentioned that they want to weigh in on? How's that process gonna work? Well, there's this situation where what, what's going to happen is uh, I will probably have to go to one of their meetings um, during our meetings or not during our meetings, depending upon when it is, and talk with them about these articles. And they will have an opportunity to ask questions and may then decide to provide some comments back in the form of a memo, which will probably come from the town manager on behalf of the board um, and be provided to all of you. The same thing would happen with us. We will have to make time on our agendas to, um, to discuss our comments on those potentially four articles that I mentioned. Um, and then I will need to provide a memo to the select board on behalf of this board delivering our comments. And that would be it. And I would assume that the sooner we can do that for them, the better. So if we could get that into um, 
one of the first two, one of the first, yeah, probably one of the first two nights of our hearings. I know that we're already jam-packed on all of those nights, but I think it would just, it would, um, in the spirit of um, trying to make this, this new, this new way of um, providing feedback and, and better communication between the two boards, I'd like to try and, and get that in if we could in the first meeting. Yeah, ideally we would do it sooner rather than later, but they also do a similar thing. Uh, where, well, they, so they, they will have a hearing and then the next meeting they usually finalize and vote. You, you wait until the end um, and deliberate and vote. So, um, so we would definitely need to do, have these discussions sooner rather than later. Right. Again, these are not, just so that we're all clear, these are not, um, we're not going to be voting on these. We're providing commentary only right. for them. And they're not a hearing. They're not a hearing for their board either. That's not, you know, neither board has that jurisdiction. Um, this is just to provide any comments. So these are our comments. We won't be taking public comments on. Correct. There's a whole public comment process. That's right. Over the right. mm -hmm. Got it. Makes sense. So I, I had hoped that this evening the warrant would have been up so that we could, you would also have a chance to look at it and say, hey, you know, let's also provide a comment on article X or, or any other article. So you might find that after it's posted and we can share that, of course, directly with you, um, if you do see that there's something more that you would like to add to your list, um, you might want to do that and that's fine. Um, these were just based upon our discussion these were the ones that we thought were most relevant and also had come up previously. So. I noticed that the select board submitted two zoning warrant articles on behalf of other groups. I, I don't recall that in the three, four years I've been on the redevelopment board. Is that a new occurrence or has that happened in the past? I don't know about when the last time was that it happened, but it of course is allowed under 40A. So right. the select board is allowed to file uh, warrant articles. Right. However, the disability commission is not. So, um, you know, that's, that's the only way that they would be able to file an article. Unless they, you know, individually, or, right. yeah, or individually, of course, or come talk to the board. Um, yeah, you know, there's, there's, there, there are other call, there are other ways in, but us, uh, give, right. I think given the timing um, and the nature of what they wanted to uh, do and their own meeting schedule, I think that was their only way of of filing their articles, which is of course an allowable manner to do that. Right. Any other questions for Jenny or Aaron on the process which kicks off at our next meeting? All right, so we will move on to the next uh, item on our agenda, which is the uh, review of the meeting minutes. So we'll start with the meeting minutes from November uh, 2nd, 2020. And I'll start with Jean to see if you have any uh, additions or corrections. I do on the second page. Can you move to the second page, please? On, um, let's see. The paragraph that's there that starts with Ms. Watson about the line that starts with pursuant to section 615 of the bylaw says the board, the word is shouldn't be there. It should say the, the board reduced. And that was the only comment I have on that. Great, uh, David? I didn't have any comments on that one. I did not either. Uh, so do I have a motion to approve uh, the meeting minutes from November 2nd, 2020 as amended? So moved. Second. Any commentary? Seeing none, uh, we'll take a vote. David? Yes. Jean? Yes. And I am yes as well. So those meeting minutes are approved. Uh, the next set of meeting minutes is, are the meeting minutes from December 7th, 2020. 
start with Jean again. Any uh, additions or changes? Yes, I just have to find it since it's keeping jumping around on my screen for one moment. Hmm. One second, sorry. Why don't I go to David first while you pull that I'm, up? I'm all, I think I had a comment and I'm also looking for it. Okay, whoever finds it first. I found it, okay. There um, we go, Jean. On the second page, these are just two down more, the paragraph that the chair introduced the second agenda item down farther on the page. There's a sentence that starts, um, Mr. Watson said that he is concerned. A little more. Where, where is it? Oh, oh, I see, said that he is concerned. Okay. It says, He's concerned about the style of propose. Style. About, about three lines up from where your cursor is on the far right hand side. It should say he is concerned about the two more proposed. lines up. It shouldn't say the style of propose, it should just say the propose. Oh no, I'm sorry about um, the style of the proposed. Sorry. So I think it, I think I was probably that was what I was looking for actually. I I think I was referring to the style of bike rack that was proposed right for the short term bike parking. Right. Got it. We did that, that together, David. That was good team. Yeah. There you go. <laughs> That was, those were my only comments on that. David, do you have anything else? Well, now I've lost it again. Uh, oh, I think, uh, so uh, on page two, in the paragraph that starts the chair closed public comment and turn discussion back to the board, in the middle of that paragraph, it says, Mr. Watson said he thinks changing mixed use spaces for more housing is not in keeping with the bylaw. I think what I, that's not wrong, but I think what I was talking about is that uh, reducing the amount of commercial space in existing mixed use spaces is not in keeping with the bylaw or mixed use buildings rather. commercial space in existing mixed use buildings. Is not in keeping with the bylaw. Commercial space. I'm pretty sure that's closer to what I said. Great, anything else? All right, uh, do I have a motion to uh, approve the December 7th, 2020 meeting minutes as amended? So moved. Second. Uh, take a roll call vote, David? Yes. Dean? Yes. And I approve them as well. So the uh, December 7th, 2020 meeting minutes have been approved. Uh, any other items before we move to open forum? Okay, uh, so we will now open public forum. Any member of the public who is uh, still with us this evening is welcome to raise your hand uh, to speak. You'll receive three minutes um, and we'll ask that you please introduce yourself by your first and last name. Uh, and your address. Please use the raised hand function if you'd like to speak. Give it another couple seconds. I don't see anyone this evening. All right, seeing no, uh, no one with their hands up, we'll close open forum. Uh, Jenny, Erin, anything else before we adjourn for the evening? 
No, thank okay. you. Okay, great. Uh, do we have a motion to adjourn? So moved. Second. We'll vote uh, again through roll call. Jean? Yes. David? Yes. And I vote yes as well. Thank you very much, everyone, and have a great evening. Good night, everyone. Good night, everyone. Good night. Thank you.